games are one of the most powerful mediums to tell stories through. Much like movies and books, video games can take us away to fantastic worlds full of excitement, mystery, and danger. But one of the primary strengths in storytelling that games hold over other mediums is the high level of interactivity that they involve. Where other mediums of storytelling can set a scene to evoke a certain emotion from the audience, games can make you participate in disturbing, emotional, or joyful events that can connect you closer to a story and its characters better than any other medium out there. Over the years, as video games have matured as both an artistic medium and a vessel for uniquely interactive stories, we've seen plots that leverage the gameplay aspect of video games to tell gripping narratives that are extremely effective at forcing us to grapple with its core themes and messages. This interaction between gameplay and narrative is called ludonarrative, and is usually paired with either dissonance or harmony. I would love to go into an in-depth explanation about Ludo narrative right now, but we're already talking about a lot of stuff in this video. Maybe in a future video though. Video games are arguably the ultimate medium for the golden rule of writing, show, don't tell. They can show a myriad of details about the plot, setting, characters, and more through just the gameplay alone. But all I've said about this unique strength of gaming is what leads me in the most roundabout way to today's topic, Dark Souls. Dark Souls is a bit of an anomaly in video games. Having the audacity to release a high fantasy action adventure RPG one month before Skyrim in 2011 sounds like the marketing blunder of the century. Now here we stand, 11 years, two direct sequels, and tons of spiritual successors later, Dark Souls spawned basically an entire new genre of games in its wake. It's clear that Dark Souls wasn't just an unfortunate medieval fantasy RPG daring to have the same release quarter as Skyrim. It was unique in its world, gameplay, and storytelling style as it offered the gaming landscape something it hadn't known it wanted yet. We've had these games around for 13 years since the release of Dark Souls' predecessor, Demon Souls, and still can't think of a genre name that adequately describes extremely challenging action RPG with rich lore, deep atmosphere, and probably some really grotesque enemy designs. Dark Souls was introduced to me how I imagine it was introduced to most people. A friend said, hey, you like RPGs, right? You should try this one, you'll love it. So you get it on sale, you boot it up, make a kawaii waifu or segoi husbando, try to explore a bit, get kicked around by the enemies, get annoyed, and quit. Until you come back after reflecting on that experience and realize the game is just asking you to be more patient and pay more attention than most games usually ask of you. Get back in the groove, kill some bosses, and then get stuck on whatever boss or area is your first wall. So you call the game impossible, throw it in the garbage, and never play it again. Thanks for watching, don't forget to like and subscribe. Until you hear some people talking about it, so you buy it again later. Start from the beginning, almost give up again, then after you finally push past that one area you've been struggling to beat for three hours, it clicks. And it all finally makes sense. Or at least... I think that's roughly how the first experience with Dark Souls goes for most people, right? This love letter is one for a game that was not an instant match made in heaven like other games in my Why I Still Play videos. I found Dark Souls to be aggravating, infuriating even. As someone who takes great pride in dodge rolling out of the way of anything as a vein main, I just assumed the game was intentionally poorly designed to be annoyingly hard so players would do their marketing for them by talking about how hard the game is. Like those bad mobile game ads that say, this game is impossible, I can't beat level 2. Except it's your friends saying it so you're far more willing to believe it and try it for yourself. But no, Souls games weren't just trying to be annoying. Every system and piece of the game was crafted to leverage the strengths of video games as a storytelling medium to create something that was truly unique and special. Whenever Dark Souls is mentioned, the first word that probably comes to mind is difficult. Hard, tough, challenging, extreme, hardcore, maybe even unfair. 
the tried and true meme of every difficult task being the Dark Souls of that thing. The difficulty of Dark Souls is integral to its experience and defines so much about it. After years of playing and really understanding Dark Souls 1, I've arrived at some semi-controversial opinions about the game that are tied into the reasons I still love playing my favorite torture simulator. First, I wouldn't call the game traditionally hard. The difficulty of Dark Souls comes primarily from its somewhat alien nature. Dark Souls just feels so much different to play relative to many other games. Nearing the end of the PS3, Xbox 360, and Wii era, known as the seventh console generation, there began a ton of discussion about where the challenge in most games had gone. Many games then, and still to this day, have been opting for the play it your way approach, with a variety of viable playstyles that rarely ever punish the player for playing the game incorrectly. With this context, Dark Souls can be rather jarring for first-time players to be punished for mistiming a swing or just playing too aggressively, forcing them to unlearn habits that have translated across so many other games. Having to respect every enemy from a skeleton to a boss is kinda weird, as most players are conditioned from RPGs to expect the low-level enemies and most of the early game to just be a pushover. Now for the hot take. Dark Souls would suffer as a game if it had an easy mode. With almost every new game released by From Software, the developers of Dark Souls, we inevitably see a wave of articles discussing if the new title should have an easy mode. Personally, here is my non-elitist explanation that doesn't need the words get good to convey. I firmly believe in games as a form of art and as a storytelling medium. There's not a ton of games that come out with no difficulty selection, making Dark Souls fixed difficulty something to respect, as it's the most honest way to say, this is the intended game experience. There is no dropping the difficulty when the going gets rough. For games to continually expand their acceptance as a form of art, more games will need the confidence to forego a difficulty slider and stick to balancing the gameplay in a way that equates with the story they are telling. I guess you could think of it like, if an artist makes a painting that has a subtle and profound meaning, but it's difficult for all viewers of the work to understand it, should the artist be asked to edit his painting to make the meaning more obvious? Or if an author writes a gripping novel that may use more complex wording that best fits the story they're trying to tell, should they rewrite their book with simpler words to make sure that everyone can understand the work? It would come at the cost of the impact that their original word choice provided for their story. The gameplay of any game is that subtle meaning in the painting or the complex diction of a great book. The difficult gameplay is part of the greater narrative of Dark Souls, and all the impact of the game's best moments in writing would be lost on an easy mode of it. One of the most beloved moments by fans is the moment when you enter the boss room of Warning, warning, entering spoiler territory for a game that released 11 years ago. Go by and play Dark Souls 1 if you haven't already. Sheesh. Gwyn, Lord of Cinder. You've gone through all of Lordran, from the heights of Anor Londo to the depths of Lost Isolith. The journey has been long and arduous, and you've psyched yourself up for this final fight against a being who was described to you during the game's intro as, essentially, a dragon-slaying god. If you could barely beat a sorty good boy, what chance do you stand here? Then you walk through the fog gate like you have so many times before in your quest to slay colossal foes and instead of an epic orchestral swell to herald your final battle, you get this. Here you face who was once known as Gwyn, Lord of Sunlight, and his title is now Gwyn, Lord of Cinder. The leftover, spent, burnt remains of a dying fire. He's a hollow, old zombie that can be parried just like any other humanoid enemy in the game. 
This isn't a duel. This is you putting him out of his misery. Dark Souls earns this scene and setup and is able to convey it without having to say a word of pre-fight exposition because it's been telling you this and preparing the rug pull from the word go with the intro establishing Gwyn as the most powerful of the four original holders of these fonts of power called Lord Souls. You fought two who held their own Lord Soul and two who were holding only a fraction of Gwyn's Lord Soul. Surely he would be even more difficult, but it's just not the case. And with an easy mode of the game, he'd just be the last easy boss in an easy game. Another reason that I still play Dark Souls that's tangentially related to the game's brutal difficulty is its community. Dark Souls is the perfect storm for creating a tightly knit community of dedicated players. The asynchronous multiplayer elements of Dark Souls, like cooperation for bosses and leaving messages, allows players to feel connected, probably even more than they would feel if the game was a full-on MMO. The world feeling uncaring and brutal, mixed in with the few and far between NPCs who mostly befall tragic fates, can make you feel unbearably alone in the world of Lordran. But knowing there's other people going through the same things that you are can be inspiring in a we're all in this together sort of way. The things that the community memes around, like Praise of the Sun, Giant Dad, and some of the creative messages from Soapstones add some comedic relief to the game's oppressive atmosphere and allows a bit of hope to shine through the game's looming feeling of darkness. The old saying, misery loves company, gains a bit more of a positive meaning through Dark Souls, as you can always find the motivation to keep going on when you see that other players are experiencing the same game that you are. That's not even beginning to touch the community discussions outside of the game, with lore explanations as far as the eye can see, guides to help new players get into the series more comfortably, as well as what leads me to my last point, interpretations of what Dark Souls is trying to say as an artistic work. I want to talk about the message of Dark Souls and the ideas being communicated through its overarching themes and narratives. There are tons of videos and posts out there about how Dark Souls is an allegory for overcoming depression, or for life in general, or questioning authority. I've even heard it interpreted as a sort of commentary on class struggle, with the poor undead being expected to put their life at risk and eventually sacrifice themselves to prolong an age of fire that doesn't even benefit them. Nothing I say here is to diminish the personal meaning that this game holds in anyone's heart, because I believe that any interpretation of it could be correct. Dark Souls is a game about nothingness. What you accomplish in the story changes nothing in the world. You just suffered through however many hours, or minutes if you're a speedrunner, of being pounded into a pulp to just maintain the world's clearly broken status quo. And that's the point. Concluding your journey through Lordran and choosing to link the flame is a fleeting, temporary victory. You linked the flame, congratulations, just like Gwyn once did. Now it's your turn to become that same shriveled shell of a powerful being, just like the one you finished fighting. What are you actually prolonging by linking the flame? The death and pain that you just had to endure to get to that point? Benny puts it best. The game was rigged from the start. There is one other ending, however leaving the flame to die out and starting an age of darkness. This ending isn't necessarily a good ending, but rather a much more uncertain ending. Do you know what an age of darkness entails? Could it possibly be worse than the age of fire that you just witnessed? When choosing between the two endings, you aren't choosing a good or a bad end to the story. Rather, you're choosing between closure and uncertainty. Dark Souls' central theme is about cycles and duality. Heat and cold, life and death, light and dark. Another fantastic element of world design in Dark Souls is that Lordran itself contains the theme of cycles through its verticality. Dark Souls makes a point of the player moving up and down in its world. Going up through Undead Burg to then go all the way down to Blight Town makes you think you've seen everything there is in this world, but you can still move higher and lower. The top of Sen's Fortress will take you up even higher to Anor Londo, 
and more importantly, continuing lower past Blighttown will take you so deep into the world that you'll come across entire civilizations that have been built on top of the Demon Ruins and Lost Isolith. This environmental storytelling piece of a kingdom built atop another kingdom punctuates the futility of the cycle. In time, Lordran will be just like Isolith, built on top of and forgotten. This theme is explored a bit in Dark Souls 2, with the destroyed Lord Vessel laying in the dirt within the mansion of Majula, and is brought front and center with the Drag Heap in Dark Souls 3. The Drag Heap is a massive amalgam of memorable locations from Dark Souls 1 and 2, all caught up in a pile of ash. Lordran is gone despite its grandeur, Drangleic is gone despite its size, all that's left is what we as players recognize as landmarks of these kingdoms, but no one else in the world does and no one cares. Funnily enough, this makes Dark Souls one of the few game series that canonically explains the idea of New Game Plus. Everything is a cycle. Beating the game is just the beginning of another cycle and you can do it all over again. I know I've spent a lot of time talking about story elements in a video about why I still play Dark Souls, but what else is there to say? The combat is awesome and intense, everyone's heard that. The game is unforgiving, everybody knows that. The part that fascinates and resonates with me is just how good the world is at tying together its theme, gameplay, and narrative in a way that is truly exceptional. It stands as a testament to the greatest strengths of video game storytelling, and how gameplay elements can make the story that much more impactful. The wordless storytelling of Dark Souls does more than the endless dialogue trees of so many other story-driven RPGs. The interpretive nature of the game lets you change how you define the game's core message, depending on what you are bringing to the game at that point in your life. I could go on and on forever discussing everything about Dark Souls that keeps me coming back to try new builds, play self-imposed challenges, or just explore everything that the beautiful, dark fantasy world of Lordran has to offer. But this has been my experience with the game, and this is why I still play Dark Souls. Hello everyone and welcome to the end of the video. This one was pretty tough to write. You could probably call it the Dark Souls of Video Essays. Anyway, I sincerely hope that you enjoyed the video. If you did, I would be thrilled if you would like the video and subscribe to the channel to hear more video essays and commentary about games. If you've been on the fence about playing Dark Souls but were turned off by the seemingly single-minded focus on difficulty, I cannot recommend enough that you pick this game up again and give it another go. To those of you who are fans of the series, I want to hear from you. What made you fall in love with the original Dark Souls? And if you're not sure about that one, then just tell me, what's your favorite boss in the whole game, including the DLC? Once again, there's just so much to say about the Soul series to be able to fit into one video. This essay was focused just on Dark Souls 1, but you can be assured that there will be videos on Dark Souls 2 and 3, Demon Souls, Sekiro, Bloodborne, and Elden Ring later down the line. Also, I might be taking a bit of a break from why I still play for a bit to cover a few other gaming topics that I've considered recently, so definitely subscribe if you want to hear those. Until then, have a fantastic day, and I hope to see you next time.